the third movement of the Beethoven Violin Concerto is a lot of fun to play and f for me it feels like a release from all this deep metaphysical um, stuff in the first and second movements and now it's just about having fun it's a wonderful dance and um, it's um, it's fun to play it's fun to listen to <laughs> It's a very intuitive kind of theme, down, how, how, it, how it kind of swings back and forth. Um, when you decide what tempo to choose, I would um, recommend looking, basically looking at the 16th notes later on, particularly. To see how fast you want to play those. <laughs> and so I generally take the tempo from there. So. There are some violinists who play it a bit slower or a bit faster. It, the important thing is that it should communicate joy and feel like the music is dancing. One of the issues this movement can have is if it sounds, if you feel each beat too much, if it sounds like da pa pa da pa 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 da pa pa da da da, and you can feel each beat, and particularly in the in the tutis that can happen, that it sounds, and that can it tends to make it slow down. Um, it can also slow down during the tutti's during, which is that's a classic Beethoven rhythm, which uh, can start to sound like da 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 da, like duplets. So I think um, of it as having only one strong beat each bar, so and not not an not an heavy half bar. And the same thing is here. So one bar plus one bar, and then two bars together, and then again one bar, one bar, and then two bars together. So that's the structure that I think is important to bring out. Now there's a long controversy. Um, with this piece because Beethoven wrote a dot for the upbeat. So that's clear. And you kind of like, it's like a little hop before you land. So that is very clear as a gesture. But then he did no longer write dots after this. There's no dot on the second one. There's no dot on this one. So there is a tradition of playing it where you play the dots on the first two and then long and that this has many adherents uh, many uh, conductors and soloists prefer it to play it this way but there are also those like me who think um, I, I think that we're still in the same theme and it's a dance I, I like to stay as much into the same character as possible so I still don't play I don't necessarily play as short when I play this it doesn't have to be but it's not not legato either it's separated from the next note not necessarily super short but it still dances that's is my goal I would argue for those people who say but there's no dot there I would say well there's no dot on the previous one either there's only a dot on the first one and surely you would never play because that would be very strange that these first two it must be the same so you're already playing a dot where it doesn't say so i think you might as well play a dot on the next one too the way i see it beethoven did not really indicate one way or another uh, whether it should be short or long because the absence of the dot doesn't necessarily mean it's long because the dot was already missing on the the upbeat of the second bar. There is such a thing as when you write the dot and then you stop, that it can also be assumed that it's a segue, that it'll be, it'll be a dot each time. But this debate has been going on for a long time. 
And I recently noticed, uh, to my amusement, <laughs> well, I recently noticed that in one of the new Urtext editions of Bärenreiter, the dot is in parentheses, but only on the version, um, on the upper version, not on the lower version. So maybe there's some new um, development that has come into this um, long running, running debate. But this is something orchestras are sometimes used to playing it long or used to playing it short. Whatever happens, the orchestra and the soloist must do the same thing because they are playing the same theme. And I think it is ultimately not the biggest deal. Uh, the piece is still the same piece, whether you play it long or short. It's, the important thing is that it must be very, very joyful and that it must dance and uh, must be a lot of fun. The third movement of the Beethoven Concerto is in rondo form. And that means that the theme comes back a number of times in between. We have these interludes, um, which are um, more fun and virtuosic. And um, this, the first one, is a classic example of a composer composing on the piano, where da 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 that would like wonderfully well with the five fingers, but we only use four fingers on the violin, so you have to shift somewhere. Either there or somewhere you have to shift in order to get get down to the D. Uh, and I find this actually quite quite tricky. This requires quite a lot of um, attention, that spot. There are other tricky moments. Some double stops and these passages in six. It, this movement does not have to go terribly fast. Um, it should be a tempo that's fun, but also still clear. So if you start feeling like it's not, it's no longer clear, it sounds kind of crazy and messy, then it's, it's actually better to play it a little bit slower, but improve the, the clarity. Because often if it's very, very clear and very steady, it might actually sound, seem faster than when it's faster, but messy. Um, so that's, that's I think an important principle to keep in mind sometimes the fastest tempo is not necessarily the most impressive, um, but it certainly should should flow along um, very nicely. The second interlude of the last movement is in minor. Uh, um, it should still basically go at the same tempo. The orchestra does an imitation of a kind of um, lyre custom, which is like a, a hurdy-gurdy. Um, so the orchestra separate, except for the violas that are that are tied. It's a very interesting thing that he wrote there, which in older editions, they used to tie everything and just everything was held, which sounds good too, but actually it's on purpose that some of the, some of the strings rearticulate each bar and others, uh, and just the violas hold the note through, which creates this kind of hurdy-gurdy Lyakasten effect, just the kind of... Um, person who stands outside and you know turns turns the crank of the of the music the end of the section um, the orchestra should be quite soft and it's one of those crescendos from pianissimo to fortissimo And that is, um, I think, quite, of course, intentionally, uh, a bit of a quote from the from the first movement when you um, I think it's maybe a little bit of a throwback there. After the cadenza of the third movement, um, Beethoven moves through various keys and finally arrives back in D major. It's, there's a tradition to play a little bit slower to emphasize the rhythm, that's kind of the, this lilting rhythm, which I think can be quite nice. Um, I personally like it when it's not too slow, just because you have to recover the tempo. And, uh, and then if you, if you go too slow, then your accelerometer has to be so huge that it's a bit, it can feel a bit frantic. So, but it, a little bit of kind of swinging back and forth um, can be very, very pretty there.
in the coda is really the only moment in the Beethoven concerto that's a bit of a balance problem where it really that needs it, both the orchestra has to be careful and also the violinist has to get try to get as much sound of the instrument as possible. So generally, I try to go for a somewhat articulate sound, not too not too brushy, and I play with full hair, which helps me get a good sound despite using a lot of weight. Whereas if I played on the side, it would get more noisy. And in terms of what the orchestra does, there are two ways of doing it. One is that the orchestra plays each second, uh, um, plays the second and fourth bar of this passage much softer, which is a bit counterintuitive for them, but that gives you a chance to be heard. Otherwise, this entire ascent is inaudible and we only hear the end of it. Um, a, a different way to get the orchestra to do the same thing would be to talk about phrasing that it goes that it adds a diminuendo on each and then light. This feels a bit more musical to the musicians, but they get the same result. <laughs> this requires to be articulate and one has to play particular um, care on the notes in the middle of the arpeggio. At least it can be possible to only hear and then and nothing in between. Similarly, this passage can also get lost because of the, the, the orchestral note is so massive. So that's just something that uh, one always rehearses. And then <clears throat> the orchestra finally could, could fade away to, to almost nothing and then And this is um, another moment where it's quite soft and then suddenly, suddenly loud without any, without too much preparation and ideally without taking too much time. Not too, not, not too massive, but just go to the end and it's a, it's a wonderful ending to a wonderful movement in a wonderful concerto that um, even after playing it for many, many years and many, many, many times, I think I actually enjoy the performance even more uh, after all this time. So I hope all this is helpful and I'll see you next time.